Hey guys, Lauren Isaacs here. I want to do a quick and concise video about why Herut does not support a two-state solution and why it would never work logically. So we're not going to get into the whole history of the land and land possession and the different empires, and we could, and I love history, but we don't need to know the nuance of history to understand why a two-state solution is illogical, it's unrealistic, and it's employing cognitive dissonance to think that it could work and everyone would be free and safe. Uh, it just wouldn't happen. So the first point I want to bring up is that history, track record. Let's look at the track record of the modern day Palestinians and the surrounding Arab countries uh, more. We'll emphasize that more. When they've had possession of land in and around Israel, all the times they've had possession before, mostly through conquest, what have they done? What is a surefire thing that they're going to do? They're going to prevent Jews from visiting biblical Jewish holy sites. It's happened every time before and it will continue to happen. I mean, Jews were prevented from going to uh, the cave of the patriarchs uh, in Hebron to visit where our ancestors are buried for many, many years when it was under Arab control. This is not okay. And to think that it would be different this time if we made this magical utopia of a two-state solution, we just gave the Palestinians a country that they wouldn't prevent us from visiting our biblical heartland, uh, you're not uh, being intellectually honest if you think that that's uh, a reality. It's happened in the past, it will happen again. Now, if we're not employing cognitive dissonance and we're being honest, how would you feel as a Jew, okay? And uh, how would you feel if you knew that Rachel's tomb is prevented from, you or will be prevented from going to visit there should it be in Arab hands, in Arab government's hands? How would you feel if uh, the Cave of the Patriarchs was once again closed off to you just because you're a Jew? I wouldn't be too happy about that and I hope you wouldn't be either. So that's, that's one thing that we have to take into consideration. Another thing we have to talk about is the fact that Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian uh, Authority, the president of the Palestinian people for the last 15, 16 years, he's been in office, he has stated categorically that not a single Israeli civilian or soldier, civilian or soldier, will set foot in future Palestinian lands. Meaning, the future Palestinian state, this utopia that we're going to create for the Palestinians, is going to be completely Jew-free. And this is not five years down the road, where do you see yourself in five years, Mahmoud Abbas? Oh, maybe I'll ethnically cleanse the Jews. No, no, he's saying it from the outset. I'm going to ethnically cleanse the Jews. There are going to be no Jews in the land from the get-go. Again, if we're being intellectually honest with ourselves, that's immoral, that's not okay. We would not accept that in any other country, and th so we are not going to accept that in Israel, especially the ancient biblical lands of Israel that have uh, you know, been legally belonging to the Jewish people for over 3,000 years. Um, another thing I want to mention, what would prevent Hamas from taking over this future wonderful Palestinian state that we're establishing? Okay, so we're going to put in a Palestinian government and they'll run it properly and fairly. Fine, that's a great idea in theory and you know, in some rainbows and unicorns land, that's a great idea, but it's just not the case. We tried it in Gaza. We've tried it before. Guess what? Land for peace has never worked. And yes, we can debate about the Sinai. That is one example that I'll give you that we'll debate about. But 99% of the time, land for peace has never worked. It has not stopped terrorism. It has not stopped the desire for the surrounding Arab countries to want to wipe Israel off the map. It has not stopped them wanting more and more and more land. So uh, what's to prevent Hamas from taking over this new Palestinian uh, land? What's to prevent it? We can't prevent it. We've created a new autonomous land for these Palestinians. But God forbid Hamas will take over just like they have in other regions and it will uh, oppress the Jews and the Palestinians. And that's terrible. So what will prevent that? Another thing we can talk about is how much is enough land, you know? Clearly for us, we have ideas. Okay, we'll concede this and this as we have in the past. But for the Arab states surrounding and the modern Palestinian government, they proclaim no land is enough. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, meaning all of Israel. What should we go back to? Uh, you know, the Camp David Accords. We could talk about the Oslo Accords ideas. We could talk about Ehud Olmert, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, Ehud Olmert, when he offered a plan that was virtually 98% of what the Palestinians were asking for, he gave it to them. And they said no. Palestinian rejectionism at its finest. What is enough land? There would never be enough land. So creating a state is only a stepping stone to negotiating ourselves out of existence. And I think that's immoral. And we refuse to do that. The last point I'll make, again, this is a crash course. Uh, I know I'm going very quickly. The last point I'll make to, uh, that you should think about is that when in the history of the world has a successful, wealthy, democratic, free country bordered a not free, uh, not so wealthy, 
theocratic or dictatorship run country and been happy and been satisfied and there's been no conflict on that border. You know, Israel is a thriving uh, liberal democracy that's extremely wealthy. We have freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom of movement. And then a Palestinian state would likely not have, uh, let's be honest, again, without using cognitive dissonance, let's be honest, it would likely not have freedom of the press, freedom of the media, because already the Palestinian controlled areas in uh, Judea and Samaria, the West Bank and Gaza do not have freedom of the press. They would not have freedom of religion as they do not have now, et cetera, et cetera. So when has a country like that bordered a wealthy, thriving, democratic, first world country and been like, okay, it's cool, we're not gonna bother you. We like that you're thriving and we're not and we're totally okay with it. That would never happen. Again, these are, are just points we need to consider. Uh, if we're talking about this in an, uh, an academic way, we can go into the history, but I'd rather just make these points and I hope some of them were compelling to you. Uh, it doesn't mean we have all the answers. People always say, okay, so if you're against a two-state solution, it automatically means you're for a one-state solution and it's the entire Middle East, whatever. I'm not necessarily saying that and I'm not gonna speak for Hirut because we all have kind of varying ideas of what a solution should be. And we can talk about that in another, another video. Leave me a comment if you want me to make a video all on that. Um, but honestly, it just means we support freedom. We support Jewish sovereignty. We support safety and lack of terrorism. And honestly, we just want people to be happy and live thriving lives. Um, let's go Am Yisrael Chai, guys. Am Yisrael Chai. If these points have been compelling or if it's given you just something to think about, uh, that's great. And please feel free to write to me and let me know what you think. Take care, guys. Am Yisrael Chai. Coming to you from the land of Israel, this has been Lauren Isaacs with Herut Canada. Take care.